Hello. Welcome to a podcast on the law and its impact on computing technology and business. This is Brian Gaff. I'm a senior member of the IEEE and partner at the Edwards Wildman Palmer Law Firm in Boston. The IEEE is presenting this podcast in conjunction with a series of articles that I co-authored on legal issues relevant to people in the computer hardware, software, networking, and service businesses. These articles are appearing in the IEEE's computer magazine each month in 2012. This podcast is part six of our series. In the last podcast, we discussed what to do if the U.S. government initiates an investigation of your business. In this podcast, we will cover some of the issues involving the use of open source software, or OSS. Joining me today for this podcast is my colleague, Greg Plusius. Greg is a partner in the Boston office of Edwards Wildman Palmer and co-chair of the firm's technology practice group. Welcome, Greg. Thanks, Brian. Greg, certain types of OSS licenses can cause real problems and be incompatible with the distribution of OSS software with a company's proprietary software. That's right, Brian. Incorporating OSS without paying attention to the license that governs its use can expose a company to lawsuits and can be expensive to remediate at a later date. Uh, If a company has sold or distributed a product that includes OSS, for example, a larger piece of software with OSS modules embedded in it, It must comply with the terms of the license that accompanied the OSS. Certain moderately restrictive licenses, such as the Lesser General Public License, often referred to as the LGPL, are compatible with commercial use if a company complies with certain requirements. But if the company is not aware of what those requirements are, there can be significant issues that could otherwise be easily avoided. Uh, For example, if a company distributes OSS that is subject to the LGPL with its own proprietary code, if the OSS is statically linked to the company's proprietary software and executable file, then in order to comply with the terms of the LGPL license, the company would effectively have to provide source code to the entire executable, including the company's proprietary source code. Obviously, that can be a significant issue when the software that's integrated with the OSS Mm -hmm. is proprietary to the company and where the company wants to keep its source code confidential. However, if the company instead distributes the OSS uh, LGPL license software, and a standalone dynamically linked library file, such as a DLL, along with a separate executable file containing its proprietary code, then the company need only provide the source code to the OSS DLL file and not to the separate proprietary executable file to uh, to comply with the terms of the LGPL license and, and the source code requirements. The intent behind the requirements imposed by the LGPL license is to enable the recipients of the larger work to be able to modify the OSS component and incorporate it back into the larger work, allowing improvements to be made. Obviously, if the OSS component is statically linked to the larger work, then the source code to the larger work is needed to recompile the entire executable. But if the OSS component is part of a separate DLL, then only the source code to the DLL is needed for this purpose. Other more restrictive licenses, such as the general public license, uh, generally with some exceptions, do not allow Um, the OSS governed by such licenses to be included as part of a larger program containing proprietary software. Unless the source code to the entire larger work, including the proprietary code, is made available under the GPL license term. I mean, there are some exceptions, but uh, very narrow. But there there are a large number of permissive OSS licenses that have relatively non-burdensome requirements, such as giving the author of the OSS credit, and in some cases impose no requirements at all on the company using and distributing the OSS. Um, including embedded as part of the company's own proprietary software. And as you know, Brian, some of the restrictive and moderately uh, restrictive open source licenses may have implications with respect to a company's patent strategy. That's right. Some of the OSS licenses provide that if a user of the OSS brings a patent infringement claim against another user of the OSS, then the patent license and in some cases also the copyright license, such party had to the OSS terminates. In the case of the Mozilla Public License, or MPL, a patent infringement claim against a contributor to the MPL license software, regardless whether the patent infringement claim had anything to do with use of such MPL license software, can result in retroactive loss of the MPL license because a user of OSS could lose rights to continue using certain OSS modules if it seeks to enforce its patent rights, and because licenses to its patents may be granted if it makes contributions, use of certain OSS licenses may need to be coordinated with decisions on patent strategy. Greg, 
given the complexities of using OSS, are there any best practices that a company can follow to minimize the chances that it will find itself in this situation? Yes, I think the first thing is it should do is educate its software engineers that OSS is not public domain software. It's, it is actually owned by a third party or third parties. Assuming that a company does not have a policy against use of OSS in its products, then it should establish approval procedures for whenever an engineer proposes to incorporate OSS. Um, de you know, depending on how frequently OSS software is incorporated, the company may want to consider uh, distinctions between different types of licenses and, and the requirements for approval. For example, US, uh, for example, use of the GPL OSS may require a review by an attorney, while u use of an OSS under a permissive license may not. The company should document and track all uses and have processes in place to assure that requirements of the applicable OSS licenses are being complied with. In any acquisition of the company, and in most investments, the company will be required to disclose what open source software it is using, and in many cases will be subject to a black duck scan to detect what OSS the company is using. Having the appropriate procedures in place and readily being able to identify what OSS has been used and under what licenses will make this process much more efficient and smooth in addition to hopefully avoiding noncompliance and significant related liabilities. Let's assume that a company determines that it distributed its proprietary code with OSS code in a manner that would have required it under the terms of the OSS license to make the source code to its proprietary software available. Can the company now be forced to make its proprietary source code so available? No. The company has breached the terms of the OSS license and or infringed the copyright in the OSS software but obtaining a court order forcing the company to disclose the source code to its software, i.e. an order from a court for specific performance under the contract, is not a remedy available for copyright infringement. It is not a remedy a plaintiff could re realistically obtain under a breach of, of contract license claim. However, a plaintiff could obtain a court order forcing the company to cease distributing the program with the OSS software and ordering the company's customers to cease using the program previously distributed with the OSS software which could have the effect of temporarily shutting down the company's business until a new product without this, the OSS software could be released. In addition, a plaintiff could obtain monetary damages, both direct damages and possibly statutory damages, and in certain cases be re reimbursed for legal fees. So th there is significant liability associated um, with, with noncompliance. Thanks, Greg, for your views on this. We hope that you found this podcast helpful in understanding some issues involving open source software. Stay tuned for our next installment in Computer Magazine. Until next time, this is Brian Gaff. And Greg Plusius. Feel free to contact us via email at bgaff at edwardswildman.com. Or at gplusius at edwardswildman.com. That's G-P-L-O-U-S-S-I-O-S -S at edwardswildman.com. Thank you. <laughs>